Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode six of the Physique Co. podcast. Today, we are lucky enough to have Dr. Mel Davis on the show. So welcome, Mel. Hello. Now, Mel has a PhD in neuroscience. Uh, she's a black belt in jiu-jitsu. And today, we are going to be going through all things nutrition psychology, so behavioral issues uh, in regards to food. So we're super excited for this one today. Um, thank you again for coming on. Uh, we've got we had a we've had a few questions that have uh, come through. We set up a poll on social media, basically saying what what do you guys want to know. Um, so I thought today we'd just go through three of those questions and just sort of give a brief uh, teaser to what we'll be hearing more of at the Renaissance Seminar on the twenty fifth of June. Awesome! Sounds great. Cool. So the first question that we actually had come through was approaching a client stuck in the restrictive binge cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, for a long period of time, what would be some ways to help with that from a trainer's point of view or from a coach's yeah, point so of view? That's a tough one. It's actually something I've thought a lot about. I've worked with a lot of clients in that state and I've written a bunch about that. Um, so I think just from experience, the first thing you have to do with a client like that is get them to sit down and recognize the lack of progress that they're making. So get them to really identify and quantify, like, how long have you been trying? How much change has happened? And sort of once they have realized that they're in this hamster wheel, they tend to be a little more open to the suggestions you have to get them out of it because slow progress is better than no progress, right? So that's kind of the mantra that I start them off with, like, slow is better than no. So it's going to take a while, but we need to get you back to a place where you can lose weight and make progress. Um, from there, something that's worked pretty well for myself, and I think Mike has used this strategy as well with clients, um, just to start them off with no rules. Just let them go into a couple weeks of just eating. Like if they want to have peanut butter for breakfast and a piece of cake for dinner and nothing in between, fine. Just two weeks of completely no rules and then sort of start to slowly institute more regulation, like have protein in every meal, eat three or four times a day things like that. But don't, if you want M&Ms or you want a donut, go have it. And just sort of get them to the place where they don't fear food anymore. And usually once you get them there and they spend enough time sort of eating freely and realizing that they're not gaining 100 pounds doing so, you can get them kind of at a more stable metabolism and ready to lose weight. But it's really a matter of having them recognize that they're not making progress and be willing to take the, the long-term steps to get there. Okay. And when you would, when you would um, decide to start implementing some of the, the quote unquote rules, would you, is there a certain time frames that you would do that? Or would you just basically recognize it off what they tell you in feedback or? Sort of a combination. I kind of treat it like um, when you bring someone out of a diet and you're slowly adding calories, usually add calories every like three or four weeks. So kind of the same thing, like freedom eating for two, three weeks, a little shorter for that one, just because it can be detrimental depending yeah. on what, what they choose. But two or three weeks isn't going to do any serious damage. And then start getting them to make sure they're getting protein, but just sort of keeping the like extreme restrictions out of it for at least four, three, four months. Okay. And then just implement things as they're getting used to it and creating better habits. Okay. Right, right. Cool. Excellent. Um, that was a great answer for that. Now, Thanks. our second question that we had coming through were, what are the most common reasons behind self-sabotage with nutrition? Yeah, I think, you know, I think we tend to think of it as coaches. When people self-sabotage, you sort of think this person just is like masochistic and they just, you know, they don't believe in themselves or something sort of psychologically wrong like that. But I think the most common cause for what we call self-sabotage is just habits that haven't been broken. So there's a ton of research showing that if you have a strongly ingrained habit, no matter what your intention or motivation or spoken desires are, that habit will often overcome if you're not being vigilant about it. So I think that it's not that people are trying to ruin their diet. It's just that they're previous habits are so ingrained that they're not able to diverge from those automatic choices at all times. So, you know, when you're trying to break a habit, you're consciously making the decision not to do the automatic choice, right? But it's hard to have the energy and the like, uh, 
want to say like bandwidth to be constantly preventing yourself from making the automatic choice. So it's just a sort of a process. I think one of the things people do wrong a lot of times is make too many big tw changes at once, right? So if you think about, um, are you familiar with Mike and James MRV concept? Yes. So if you think about that in terms of your MRV for, you know, willpower and change, there's a certain amount of space you have or amount of willpower that you have to make a change. So if you wake up one day, you've been eating terribly for years and not exercising and you're like, I'm going to train for a marathon and, you know, get my powerlifting numbers up and lose 30 pounds and I'm going to start changing all of these different things. It's really unlikely that any of them will change. So sort of picking a single change, making that a habit and putting all of your focus and willpower into making that change and then adding another one once that's sort of solidified is kind of a better way to do it. But a lot of people, it's hard for people to start one part of their fitness journey and leave the other as is. Yeah. Okay. But it can help you be more successful. And for those of you who don't know the MRV, uh, maximum recoverable volume, if you go back and have a look on podcast number three, Mike goes through all of that in great detail as well. So just a heads up for that. Cool. Now, is there any strategies that in, in terms of what we were just going over there with, uh, with, with helping that with self-sabotage in, in, in terms of you saying, instead of just trying to go at everything, um, what would you do in that situation when you had a client that you recognize that happening with straight away? Yeah. So, I mean, before you start narrowing down the goal to something very specific and not to like life changing is a good way to start. But then once they've started towards that goal and you see them doing these self-sabotage things, um, one thing that they've shown in literature really helps with these kind of automatic responses that you have like an intention to change, but then you don't all the time is to make a set up a verbal agreement with yourself and walk through it like i'm going to go to this work meeting if i'm offered a drink i'm going to say no may i please have a diet coke and actually like either write down or say out loud that thing so then you have an alternative automatic response so you might you know if you're at a work meeting and you haven't done that and someone offers you a drink you might be like gin and tonic because that's what you always say and then you've said it and it's too late and there's social pressures and things. But if you've rehearsed, when I hear someone say, do you want a drink? I'll say, do you have Diet Coke? Then it's easier for that to come out as your automatic response. So sort of setting up these cue associated responses helps you eliminate the old habitual ones little by little. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So like going through with your client and rehearsing like the potential pitfalls and like better responses than they usually would have. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So setting up, uh, it's almost, it's not, not necessarily setting up individual and specific, you know, goals for, for what you do, but more just creating a, a, a better reaction to these right. sort of issues. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and just cool. like a collection of better reactions results in progress basically yeah. and a loss of old habits. Okay. And that will actually lead us into our next question, uh, which is dealing with social pressures for nutrition. So I think this is a, a very, very big one, just from my experience um, in coming back and seeing uh, this is a huge downfall for clients when they're sort of just starting out and their friends and, and social pressures yeah. haven't sort of are not working with them. Um, yeah. what, what would you uh, advice would you give to a client in that situation? Yeah, so I think one of um, one of the biggest things is that it's really hard. It's been shown over and over in the literature with all kinds of goals and different scenarios in life. If you have something you're working towards and you're doing it sort of in secret or in hiding, you know, a lot of people don't want to tell their friends they're on a diet and things when they're first getting into nutrition. It's embarrassing or it's weird. Um, doing Working towards something like that in isolation makes you less likely to pull it off because people will like not go out with their friends, not go see their family. And they'll start just, you know, hiding alone in their house to try to reach their goal. And then you end up having double stress, right? You have the stress of the diet or whatever you're working on and you have the stress of being isolated and not doing your normal social fun things. So one of the best things to do is keep going out, keep hanging out with your friends and just practice sticking to your goal 
and telling your friends beforehand. Don't just show up and say, oh, I'm not drinking. I'm on a diet. Call them up and be like, hey, I'm doing this thing. It's really important to me. Like, I'm going to feel really good about myself if I can get through this three-month diet and pull off my weight loss goals. And it's really like important. Can you help me out and just be supportive and not not give me crap about it, you know? And most people, if you call them up and do that, they'll be cool and they'll support you. And a lot of times they'll even switch the roles and instead of giving you crap for not drinking, they'll give you crap if you taste someone's French fry and be like, hey, I thought you were on a diet and you end up getting more cheerleaders and less of that social pressure. So you can kind of set yourself up for that if you're just honest and assertive about what your plans are. Okay. So from also from a, a coach's point of view, that's something, these are just sort of tips and advice things that you would give to clients uh, when they first start out. If these are issues that they do bring up with you. Yeah, de definitely. I always tell my clients, you know, like let your friends and family know what you're doing. Like let them be your cheerleaders. Tell them it's important to you. Have them be proud when you succeed. And people usually, most people are, are cool and supportive if you come to them one on one like that. And if they're not, you know, maybe maybe you need a new friend. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now, just as our final question, uh, as overall, so we've gone through a few things on specific issues. If somebody was to come to you and just to say, look, I need some advice on uh, nutrition and what I need to do, and I've I've yo-yo dieted for most of my life. Um, what would be the three top tips that you could you could give me or anybody? Yeah, so I the three tips I would give would be number one, start with a diet break. I think that um, one of the most important things in terms of living a healthy life where you can have control over your weight and not be sort of a slave to food and feel like it's this guilt-ridden thing that you're always dealing with is to get in a position where you can diet successfully. So a three-month break from dieting where you eat healthily, but you still indulge in some things. So you're not, you know, binge eating, but if you feel like a piece of cake, you have a piece of cake um, before beginning a diet. And then tip number two would be when you're not on a diet, make sure that when you choose the things, a lot of people get off a diet, you know, and they'll choose anytime they see a delicious food, they're like, I'm not on a diet, I have to eat that food now, you know, it might never show up again, they have this urgency about it. So a lot of times I tell my clients who struggle with the sort of binge cycle to pick and choose, you know, like look at the, the temptation that's in front of you. If it's one of your favorite things, eat it and enjoy it, you're on maintenance. If you like it, but it's eh, not your favorite flavor of donut, leave it alone and let it go. And developing that sort of power over um, and self-control without complete restriction sets you up not to think about food as good or bad or guilt-inducing guilt or not and uh, makes it just more a regular part of life. And then I think the third tip is to remind people to enjoy the rest of their lives like these kinds of things shouldn't be so stressful and all-encompassing because there's so much more to life like if you're healthy and in decent shape you should be happy and this should be like a luxury thing that you get to do because you live in a place and a time where you have the freedom and the comfort to do such things so those are my my three tips okay cool it's a, it's a good take on it just because as we as we were talking about previously is you know we get a lot of the time we hear everything in terms of you know the calorie deficits deficits maintenance surplus things like that but be able to strip it back all the way to uh beginning and for yeah. people that have never been within this you know this is everything is brand new to them calories right. macros everything like that and to be able to strip it back to this position i think is super super important i think 80 or 90 percent of the population trying to lose weight this is uh the area that they get stuck on so it's yeah, yeah. it's great to be able to you know strip these things back and hear these things and say okay cool well, these are things that we can implement even before we have a look at counting macros counting calories right. now are you excited to be coming out to perth i'm super excited we so, like i was telling you earlier uh the whole team has been to australia a few times but we've never made it to the west coast so we're all super stoked to get over there yeah meet some and quokkas. meet some quokkas yeah well as I was, as I, as we were saying the 
you will be here at right smack bang in the middle of winter. So yeah, yeah. we're going to hope we can get over there and the quackers will still be out though. So nice. Um, so yeah, so June 25th, guys, we'll have Dr. Mel Davis, the whole Renaissance periodization team will be here. We'll be going through everything, training, nutrition, uh, recovery, diet psychology. So it's going to be not to be a day to miss. Um, if you guys have any questions to Mel, uh, on yourself, where would we be best to contact you? Um, you can either contact me through RP on the website or my RP Instagram is regressive underload. There's an underscore between that. So regressive underscore underload. Okay. You can shoot me questions in there and I'll, I'll add some answers to my talk. And also as well, it's, uh, it's a great page for some uh, good memes as well. So. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Okay. Well, we'll see you on the 25th of June. And thank you so much for coming on today. We really appreciate that. Awesome. And thank you for having me. Have a great night. Thanks. You too.